I never imagined the day that I would be standing in Digbeth as the High Sheriff of the West Midlands giving a keynote speech about the future of the creative industries might look like in 100 years. It's absolutely right that Birmingham should be a focus for the creative industries. As timely as the city and Greater Birmingham is an upward creative industrial curve. Exports and jobs have increased over the last five years. Local stats from employment, economics, education and marketing teams are showing good traction and we are officially the UK's startup capital. Many artists, curators, consultancies, digital agencies, new and old media companies, games and software developers, jewelers, designers, makers of all creative sorts are doing great work. But for some reason, we've not got the critical mass that is needed if our offer is to be recognised in the short term, never mind the next 100 years. We have a new government, and we have a government that is open to being influenced. I really believe working together is in all of your interests, and there is a real opportunity to change policy in a way that suits your industry. When I talk to my colleagues, they say, oh, West Midlands is all about manufacturing. It's a lot about manufacturing. But actually, the creative part is the bit that adds the magic. The creative industries are worth a whopping £76.9 billion per annum. They provide 1 in 12 jobs, and the rate that new jobs are appearing is over 50% higher than the UK job market as a whole. One of the unique things about Birmingham is a panel like this. For me, it's about collaboration and innovation. We've got to learn from some of the European countries that you can't just do radio or film or, or marketing in isolation, but if we put them all together, we have a greater impact. Those of you in the creative sector are one of the, I suppose, the few industries that are absolutely cross-cutting in terms of being uh, enabling people like me to be able to do my, my job. I think um, whether you're in health, whether you're in policing, whether you're in retail, ultimately we need to leverage the expertise and talent that sits within your industry. So we're a creative collaborative workspace for art, technology and science. And so we're home to a really interesting community of practitioners from um, a biochemist working with NASA to send bacteria into space and see what happens when it comes back down through the Earth's atmosphere, to um, artists working with digital technology um, and creative coders. I find the whole idea of creative industries quite fascinating because, and the idea that actually it's all great um, because you're dealing with, um, you know, artists and arts organisations that, um, you know, are still primarily publicly funded and you know lots of conversations about you know paying artists fees and then you have you know I work with amazing computer scientists who are paid a kind of phenomenal day rate which is like three times that what you would pay an artist so the idea of collaboration is is really interesting and the idea of having a kind of unifying voice. I know on panels you're meant to have answers but but I've got something that's really worrying me and that's trying to make a distinction between creativity and artists and engineers. So much of the innovation, both in this city and in the BBC, and, and innovation of a, of a world-changing nature has been led by scientifically trained engineers. And I think we shouldn't force a distinction between the two. I think it's the intersection between artists and engineers which is where exciting change happens. I think it's a fascinating time because video games have always been an, an interesting mix between engineering and art because you always had two completely, 50% of the team split in half. You had a load of artists and animators who wanted to make something beautiful and creative and you had a load of programmers who wanted to make something that ran beautifully well and never had any bugs in it and never the twain shall meet. But they had to if you were going to get a game finished. So there's a, there's a phenomenal amount of learning now in the games industry over the last three decades of people who understand working together and being creative, but also being able to engineer something that's efficient and effective and, and doesn't break down all the time. We were talking about um, the, this young population that we have and how um, these dialogues are happening, but we feel like we need to include more of these younger people, these, these younger creative communities, these younger companies. These, these are the agencies that need to be involved in these conversations because they're not only going to be the employees of the future, they're going to be the leaders of the future as well. And what do you think is being done and what do you think needs to be done? We were talking a lot about um, a, a communication barrier that there seems to be and a lot of great work's being done, but it comes back to this thing of it's either not translating or we're not we're not effectively having the right conversations with the right people. So we need, I, think, I guess it starts with platforms like this. There are young people here. Is there some, th something in the dialogue that we're having that we can incorporate younger people in in the first place? Is the problem that the inability to communicate, is that in the education sector? Is that, do you think, in the employment sector? What sort of age groups do you think could be sort of tapped up and are not being tapped up? 
I think a lot of great work's happening. I think a lot of conversations are happening in education, but it seems like, from my personal experience, the second you get out of university, oh. So perhaps there's something that could be done around that age. I mean, uh, there's a lot of creative companies that started, uh, started by young people from about the age of 18. There's a lot of that happening, um, and there seems to be a disconnect there, so perhaps around that area. This country was the first to introduce design and technology for all pupils aged 5 to 16. And I think the worrying thing for me is that when you look at the statistics, um, in 2013, D&T was the, the most popular optional GCSE subject. 450,000 people took it. This year, 250,000 people took it. So there is a, a huge decline because everything that is being said suggests that um, a future in creativity isn't worth it. And I think we've got to keep looking at the big, the, the big picture because if we don't fight for um, the inclusion of creativity in our, right from the very early ages, um, in, in 100 years' time, we're not going to be having this conversation because somebody else in the world will be dominating what, what we do. In a time of economic constraint, you have to be able to make very clear arguments about the economic value of these things. But I think it's also about having inspiring role models. I think in all the creative industries, um, whether it's the engineering end of our industries, whether it's the ideas and creative end of the industries, we've got to speak outside ourselves, to, whether it's to children, their families who worry about what their children study because they're worried about economic impact. I personally don't think we talk about often enough in these conversations is why creativity, the cultural interests and the arts are good for you and by being good for you with reference both to health and well-being but also our national, you know, in terms of citizenship. I think we have to tell that story. What both those hard economic, how will my children feed themselves if they study this at school? We can answer that question. But also why does it make the UK a better place for us all to be. And I think those, are, those arguments done through role models telling their stories is an important thing to do. So part of the challenge is how do you engage young people in these kind of conversations? Where do they get their inspirations from in order to join in the conversation? I, I think one of the most powerful questions is somebody sort of recognising a bit of your talent and saying, you know, come over here a bit. Did you know this was even possible? You, know, you might be interested in this. Did you know that the thing that you're quite good at and you seem to spend a lot of your time on rather than the things I'm trying to make you do, which you don't particularly want to, actually you can make a living in that way. And it's how do those doors get open? How do, those, how, how do the signposts happen? Actually, the, the biggest threat to the arts in the UK has nothing to do with government investment in funding or city council's investment in, in funding for the arts. It's to do with education policy and what happens to kids really from the age of five going up through you know to to what they're required now to do for the new GCSE for the new A-level syllabuses um, and it's not just the placing of the arts in the curriculum it's the way historically going back now over the last 10 to 15 years the way art subjects have had to be delivered according to national curriculum constraints what it really means to have a meaningful arts education at primary and secondary level, not just a kind of routine tick box exercise that says, well, you know, the kids have been to see a concert, they've, they've learned how to make a painting or any of those things, but to have a really deep meaningful engagement with the experience of being a creator and a spectator and in some sense maybe a leader in the arts. I have to say it's been fascinating listening to everyone speak tonight for I'm very much the new kid on the block. In UK terms, it's clear to me that there has been a land shift in the balance of power. It's not all about Manchester or London anymore. Much of what I've heard tonight has absolutely reinforced my reasons for joining and underlines the huge potential Birmingham has as a city. And we want you all to be part of this national movement. Any of the things that we've talked about, education skills, whatever else, and lots of things that we haven't talked about, both on a regional level, national level, and crucially on an international level. That's what we want you to engage with us about. So do be part of that movement.